All right, well, welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. If you've missed any of the previous studies, uh, then you can go back. We have these available on our YouTube page. So we are in Genesis, and we want to look at Genesis chapter 30. So Genesis chapter 30 is where we are today. And we're going to do a little bit of recap of where we were last week, and then we will continue to press on in the book of Genesis in chapter 30. What we saw last week was this back and forth between the wives of uh, Jacob, uh, Rachel and Leah. Rachel realizes that she's not having children, but her sister is. Her, her sister is bearing uh, Jacob children, and she is disturbed about this. Now, culturally, this is a problem, but there's also this Oh, sibling rivalry as, whether, as well as this rivalry between wives, right? Rachel and Leah are not only sisters, but they are also rival wives, right? There's this jealousy, there's this envy um, that, that's happening between the sisters. They want to one-up each other. So Rachel comes to Jacob and she begs him, uh, give me a child or I'm going to die. And of course, Jacob gets angry because he realizes that he can't do anything about this. He says, um, am I in the place of God? And um, he's just recognizing, and of course he says that, that God is the one who has kept you from having children. So he's angry about that. But the, the problem is that Rachel wants to have a child probably for multiple reasons. And again, one of which is to, uh, to show her sister that she too can have children. Uh, remember, she is the loved one anyways, right? She's the one who's loved. Um, Leah is not. And there's a hatred. There's a, um, uh, there's a lack of affection for Leah. And so Leah has born a number of children. So anyways, Rachel decides, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you my servant. And I want to have a child through my servant. And then there's this back and forth, both with Rachel and Leah. They both give their, their servants, their handmaidens to have children um, through them. Now, again, this was a custom of the day that uh, children born through kind of a surrogate mother uh, or a surrogate wife were kind of born f uh, for that, that wife, right? We saw this in the life of Abraham and Sarah as Sarah gives her handmaiden to Abraham as a wife and um, she has a child through her but there's always something about having a child physically yourself. So that, that's part of what's going on here. Uh, at the end of uh, this section in verse 22, we read, Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son, said, God has taken away my reproach. She called his name Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. So that's how that section ends. That's where we pretty much left it off last week. Um, God opens up Rachel's womb and allows her now to have a child, and that child is uh, Joseph. All right, so let's take a look at verses 25 through the end of that chapter. So chapter 30, starting in verse 25, says this, As soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me away, that I may go my own home uh, that I may go to my own home and country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, that I may go, for you know the service that I have given you. But Laban said to him, If I have found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Name your wages, and I will give it. And Jacob said to him, You yourself know how I have served you, and how your livestock has fared with me, for you had little before I came, and it has increased abundantly, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now, when shall I provide for my own household also? He said, What shall I give you? Jacob said, You shall give me nothing, if you will do this for me. I will again pasture your flock and keep it. Let me pass through all your flock today removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and they shall be my wages. So my honesty will 
answer for me later when you come to look into my wages with you every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs if found with me shall be counted stolen laban said good let it be as you have said but that day laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted every one that had white on it and every lamb that was black and put them in the charge of his sons and he set a distance of three days journey between himself and jacob and jacob pastured the rest of laban's flock and jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plain trees and peeled white streaks in them exposing the white of the sticks he set the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs that is the watering places where the flocks came to drink and since they breed when they come to drink flocks bred in front of the sticks and so the flocks brought forth striped speckled and spotted and jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the striped and all the black in the flock of laban he put in his own drove apart and did not put them with laban's flock whenever the strong of the flock were breeding jacob would lay the sticks in the troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the sticks but for the feebler of the flock he would not lay them there so the feebler would be laban's and the stronger jacob's thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks female servants and male servants and camels and donkeys okay so at this point in jacob's life he's really ready to to head home right we saw that in verse 25 as soon as rachel had born joseph jacob said to laban send me away that i may go to my own home and country he's ready to go home he's been away from his family and his home long enough He's gotten a few wives he's got a number of children he's just ready he's ready so jacob approaches laban and says send me away that i may go to my own home and country give me my wives and my children for whom i served you that i may go for you know the service that i have given you verses 25 and 26. so what's going on here what, what what's he doing what is jacob doing at this point well, he's reminding Laban of all that he's done and that he has been faithful, right? He's faithfully been working for wives and children, uh, for everything that he has. He's been trustworthy, right? He, he's, he's done it honestly, we could say. Um, that's really what he's trying to present here. Jacob's trying to present himself as a trustworthy man and everything that he has, he's worked for. He, he's also saying that he doesn't owe Laban anything and he isn't trying to steal from him right very interesting that Jacob wants to show himself to be an upright man at this time especially because of his background now could it be that Jacob is learning is is Jacob maturing is he recognizing maybe the fruits of deceit is he is he recognizing what it feels like to be on the receiving end of somebody uh, deceiving you or um, trying to get over on you, something like I think he is. I, I, it seems like he's beginning to mature in this area. Um, at least, again, he's growing in that direction. I don't think he's fully there yet, but I think he's beginning to learn some lessons. I think he's growing. So what does Laban say? Well, he basically wants to keep Jacob around. He doesn't want Jacob to leave. Laban believes that he's being blessed because of Jacob. Well, is that true? Yeah, it, it seems that God is blessing him because of Jacob. Very similar thing. Um, God had mentioned that um, Abraham, that he was going to bless Abraham and Abraham's friends were going to be blessed and his enemies were going to be cursed, those kinds of things. So there's something similar going on here. God is blessing Laban, not because Laban is great or righteous or holy or anything, but because he is surrounded by, because, because Jacob is working 
with and for Laban. And so Laban is receiving some blessing from simply being in close proximity, you could say, to, to Jacob. He is receiving some of the overflow of the blessing. And that happens even today. If you have a Christian who works for a company or something like that, you know, if the Christian is living up to who they are called to be, um, that, that company is going to receive blessings. They're not going to be, um, that, at the very least, the Christian is not going to be stealing things. They're not going to be um, embezzling money or something along those lines. It's not going to be taking advantage. So there's going to be some blessings there. And so I think we can even see that today in our lives. But here, it's clearly in the area of finances, uh, riches, right? Material possessions. Uh, with flocks and things like that. So Laban believes that he's blessed because Jacob's there, and that certainly seems to be the case. Because God is blessing Jacob, there's going to be some overflow of that blessing. Now, the way that Laban comes about discovering this fact is, Laban says that he's he's used divination. What's divination? Well, it's basically like magic, right? Um he, he's trying to figure out why he's being blessed, and he uses some form of magic, some form of divination to try to figure this out. We're not told exactly what that is. We're, we're not told how he goes about it, um, but he goes about it, and he believes that he's got um, confirmation that that's what's going on. He is being blessed because of, uh, because, because of Jacob. Now, did Laban actually find that out by using magic, by using divination? Or was it pretty obvious from everything that was going on that Jacob was really the one that was, in a sense, creating the wealth for Laban, right? That, that Jacob is a, um, whether he's hardworking or whatever, whatever Jacob is doing is producing. Could, could he see that? Um, and just recognize that and then of course use his magic divination to try to come up with a confirmation we don't know for sure is um are there satanic influences behind this kind of stuff maybe it's possible but it's also possible that laban simply saw what was going on with jacob and how he was being fruitful right blessed through that and then simply turn to his divination to find a, a confirmation. Whether or not the divination actually did anything, we don't know. We don't know. But the point is that Laban believes that, right? Laban believes his divination worked, and he believes that um, this was confirmation. Either way, it doesn't really matter for the purposes of our study. Um, however it worked, in whatever way it worked, he knows he's reaping the benefits of having Jacob work for him. And he's really unwilling to let him go. He, Laban does not want to let him go, right? If you had somebody who was making you lots of money and you knew that whatever they were doing was increasing your wealth, you'd be unlikely to want to see them leave, right? So Laban asks Jacob, what, what do you want, right? What do you want for your compensation? What do you want for your pay? What do you want for your wages? To, to stay. And Jacob starts out by reminding Laban, very interesting, Jacob starts out by reminding Laban of what he already knows, right? Laban already knows that he's blessed, but he kind of gets a reminder, you're getting rich because of me. And then Jacob says, I'll take all of the speckled and spotted sheep and the goats for my wages, right? All the black ones, all the ones that are speckled and spotted. Now, from what I understand, as I look this up, this was kind of an uncommon thing, that there, there would have been fewer speckled and spotted sheep and goats. It would have been somewhat unusual, which is probably why Laban has no problem. Um, but let's ask the question, why does Jacob want these? Well, just from a practical standpoint, it's a way of identifying which animals belong to Jacob and which ones don't, right? In fact, Jacob goes on to say that Laban can, can check him, check, you know, Jacob's honesty. You can see if I'm being honest with you, Laban, Jacob says, um, by walking through my flocks. And if you find any that are not spotted and speckled, then you can consider them stolen, right? So this is a checks and balances. It's kind of a way of uh, having a natural 
um, tagging process, right? Natural identifying marks. So Laban agrees to this. And again, if this was uncommon, um, to have spotted and speckled um, sheep and goats, then of course Laban would be excited about that. He's going to get very few and Laban's going to get a lot, right? Jacob will get a few and Laban will just get a lot of these um, animals. So Laban agrees to the conditions, but we know what kind of man Laban is. We know what kind of man he is. So in verses 35 through 36, Laban goes out that very day. You see that? Look at verses 35. But that day, Laban doesn't wait. That day, Laban removed the male goats that were striped and speckled and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted and every one that had white on it and every lamb that was black and put them in the charge of his sons. And he set the distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob. And Jacob pastured the rest of Laban's flocks. So, he's trying to get over on Jacob already. I mean, he's removing any of the ones that Jacob said he would take as his wages. He's doing that right away. So he's going to separate those right off the bat. Um, he's, still a, he's still a cheat. He is, um, he's still uh, deceptive. And he's trying to get over on, on Jacob. Now, does Jacob know what kind of man Laban is? Of course he does. He's, he's lived there long enough. He's experienced already with his wives, Rachel and Leah, um, deceptive practices. And I'm sure he's seen Laban do these kinds of things in business and, and with other people, I'm sure. Um, so how does Jacob choose to act and deal with Laban? How does he choose to act? Does he choose to respond in a way that um, is honorable, is respectable, is godly? Well, he really just wants to fight fire with fire, doesn't he? He's going to try to cheat Laban. He's going to try to get over on Laban. He's going to try to get back at Laban. And how is he going to do it? He's going to do it by using divination, using magic, using superstition. Um, and you can see that in the rest of that, uh, the rest of that chapter, right? Verse 37 through the end of the chapter there talks about that. So even though Jacob is learning what it feels like to be cheated and he's feeling the fruits of deception and what they are, he hasn't fully grown out of those kind of old habits. He still has some of those ab old habits that remain. Maybe reminds us of ourselves at times. Still some of those old ways of thinking and acting Sometimes they pop up. Um, can we become more mature? Can we strive to be more Christ-like? I think we can. Um, and sometimes we fail. Sometimes we sin. Sometimes we fall back into old habits. Uh, we should never accept that. We should never be okay with that. Um, but I think in some ways we can see, yes, Jacob seems to be making some progress in his moral character. But he's not fully there yet. So here he's going to try to fight fire with fire, right? He's going to use divination. And of course, the rest of this section is all about Jacob trying to cheat Laban out of his flocks, right? He's going to use magic. He's going to use these sticks. And he's going to stripe them up and spot them up and speckle them up so that when the sheep and the goats and the, the flocks, when they come in, and they're strong, right? Only the strong ones. When they come in to, to drink water and when they come in to mate, he's going to lay these sticks in front of them and that's going to cause these sheep and these goats to have um, offspring, right? To have these um, babies that are spotted and speckled and, and Jacob's going to grow and be blessed through this magic. He's going to get one over on Laban. Does Jacob have to do this? in order to be blessed and prosper. No. No, see, God had promised that he was going to bless Jacob. God had promised that he was going to care for him. This is really Jacob doing things by his own 
power, by his own power, trying to do things his way. You know that old song, I did it my way. That's Jacob's theme at this point. I did it my way. I'm going to do it by my own strength, by my own cunning, by my own power. Do we ever try to do things in our own ways? Do we ever try to take things into our matters into our own hands and in doing that do it do ungodly things? Do we ever do that? Are we ever tempted to do that? Yeah. Do we ever try to work by our own power, by our own strength, our own cunning? craftiness and end up making a mess of things or end up sinning yeah, we probably can learn from Jacob here as well so let's ask the question though was it because Jacob was doing these magical things that he's increasing in wealth right that these um, spotted and speckled animals are are increasing in number is it because he used magic well of course not God was the one that was blessing him and in fact God is blessing Jacob in spite of Jacob right God is blessing Jacob in spite of what Jacob is actually doing and the reason for that is because we'll remember that that God had made unconditional promises to Jacob and God is going to be faithful to his promises regardless, right? Because this is, God had made unconditional promises to Jacob. So God's going to be faithful. God didn't require that Jacob do certain things. And he just said, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to bless you. Now, Jacob, you'll remember, had kind of sworn some oaths to God. If you do this, then I'll do that. But God had simply said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to be with you. And again, it's not just for Jacob, as it wasn't just for Abraham. When God blessed Abraham and gave him unconditional promises, it wasn't for Abraham alone. Abraham received blessings, true. But it was for the world, right? God is seeking to bless the world. So again, God is going to bless Jacob. Um, he made unconditional promises to him. And God's faithful. He's going to keep his promises, regardless of how Jacob acts, because God's big picture plan is to bring Jesus into the world that he can bless all nations and all families. All right, so what have we seen in this chapter, right? The ending of this chapter that we've looked at. Well, we've seen that Jacob is ready to return home. Uh, he wants to depart. There could be a lot of reasons of why Jacob wants to leave. He may very well have had enough of Laban's trickery and deception. We don't know everything that's been going on. He might think, well... I've had enough of these wives bickering and all of this, and if I, if I go back home, maybe that'll help settle this. He could be homesick, um, ready to head back to the promised land. There's a number of things that, that probably are going on here, probably a number of factors, but he's ready to go. He's got a child by Rachel, uh, Joseph. He's ready to depart. He wants to go back home. Well, Laban's unwilling to let him go because Laban knows Jacob is blessed and I am reaping the benefits. I am, I am getting richer because Jacob is working for me. And so he wants to keep him around as long as possible. So he asks Jacob, what do you want? And Jacob finally says, I want some flocks. Um, I want some, some animals. I want some, some wealth, right? I want some of this. So if you'll just give me the... Uh, Spot, spotted and speckled and striped and and the black lambs and sheep and goats then that'll be my wages and I'll work for you and um, you'll know if I've stolen anything from you if um, if you walk through and you find anything that's not spotted and speckled and that kind of thing uh, Laban says yeah that's great so that works for me and uh, he's gonna go out of his way though to make sure that uh, he can get as much out of Jacob as possible. So he goes and takes, of all his flocks, he takes all of those that, that are spotted and speckled and he removes them and gives them to his sons to, uh, to be in charge of. And then Jacob takes the rest of the flocks. And I think Laban is hoping that Jacob will receive very little in the way of spotted and speckled um, 
Finally, Jacob decides he is going to um, fight fire with fire. He's going to get over on Laban, kind of that streak of Jacob the thief, Jacob the deceiver, Jacob uh, the one who is getting over on someone else is still there. He's still got some of those old habits to work through. And he is going to use superstitious magic, superstitious divination to try to uh, increase his wealth. And in the midst of all this, it works, but it works in spite of that, right? God is the one who is blessing Jacob. God is not controlled by this uh, divination, this superstition. God planned on blessing him regardless. And um, even though Jacob thinks he's manipulating the situation, he's not. God's in control, and God is going to bless him. Um, and Jacob didn't have to do this. He didn't have to do this. God was going to bless him regardless. Um, so in spite, in spite of Jacob's bad behavior, God is still blessing him. And that just goes back to show us that when God makes a promise, he keeps it. God is going to keep his promises. All right, well, I hope the study has blessed you this evening, and I hope to see you next week. We'll get into chapter 31 starting next week.